Thanks very much, and uh, thanks very much for the invitation to speak here today. Um, so, my talk is about NAMA, and the um, topic is that it's not all about NAMA. And um, I think there's maybe a perception that NAMA is in charge of everything that isn't an owner occupier home in Ireland, and I'm just going to uh, debunk that myth a little bit, but just tell you a little bit about the organisation as well. And before I did, I just wanted to touch on its reputation and the way people perceive it, because if you look in Irish society at the moment, um, there, it's clear there are a number of groups who we love to hate. Um, there are bankers, politicians, developers, and our friends in the European Central Bank. And there's one organisation which straddles all four of those groups, and that's NAMA. So it's not really that surprising that it's not a terribly popular organisation. And um, I think that it does own an awful lot of bricks and mortar in Ireland. In, and in fact, it's the biggest property company in the world. But despite that, I guess like many stories we come across in journalism, it's a little bit more complicated than it seems at first. So to fathom now, I wanted to briefly explain the agency's purpose and how it works. The idea behind it is relatively simple. As we know, the Irish banks engaged in a lot of high-octane lending to developers during the boom. The banks weren't going to be repaid the money which they had lent to the developers, and uh, that's why they went bust. They were rescued by the state, and then the country had to be bailed out by the EU and IMF uh, for a number of reasons, but one of which was that it had taken the step of rescuing the banks. Um, banks rely on money which they get, by and large, from depositors. And the way they make their money is by lending out that money at a higher interest rate to somebody else. And when the crash came, the people who lent money to banks didn't want to do so anymore because they didn't know if they were going to be repaid, and they were absolutely right. One of the answers to make the banks seem more transparent and more simple was to remove the large property loans from their books. And what that effectively did is that it allowed a situation where people could really see what was left in the banks and see if they were trustworthy and they were going to lend to them. Um, for the first time in three years this week, we saw that the Bank of Ireland was able to raise money on its own without using the government guarantee. That is a very significant step because previously people thought it would be a long time before that would happen. Now, you could argue one of the reasons that has happened is because of the existence of NAMA. I'm not particularly going to say that NAMA is going to be a success, and I really think that anybody who makes that kind of judgment call uh, can't really make it for many, many years to come. But at least it outlines why NAMA has come into existence. It has been done before. It's been done in Sweden. It's been done in the US. It's been done in Indonesia. The difference between NAMA and other agencies like it in other countries is this. NAMA took the property loans from the entire banking system, and that hasn't been done before. In other countries, they took property loans from a number of troubled banks. So, to a certain extent, we're into a very new territory with NAMA in Ireland. I just wanted to mention how it actually works. Uh, the first thing to bear in mind is NAMA is not buying property. It's actually buying the loans lent to people who either bought land or property or were planning to build, build on land. The second thing to bear in mind is everyone has a perception that with NAMA, it's only bad loans where the developers are bust. That's not actually the case. They've also taken on board good loans too. Um, and there have been very controversial cases, particularly uh, in Britain, involving Paddy McKillen, where some of the loans were actually in okay shape and the properties they bought were delivering cash. But by and large, a lot of them aren't. And that's why when uh, NAMA took over these loans, it basically applied a discount of 60% to what it paid the banks. And when it applied that discount, it left an enormous hole in the banks and ultimately the Irish public had to shovel in 64 billion euro 
into the banking system to fill that hole and just to put that money in perspective that's roughly as much as ireland would collect in taxes over a two year period and people often say is it only the banks that led to all our problems well that's not quite true either if you look at uh ireland's borrowing it's going to peak at around 200 billion euro and you can say that 64 billion euro of that is because of the banks and the rest of it is because we're simply spending more than we're taking in in tax every day so but a lot of it comes down to the craziness and uh the amazing property bubble that we have um the ecb gets an awfully bad rap in this country and i'm no defender of it and i think that some of the decisions it's made have been very poor but it's worth bearing in mind how nama actually gets its money how does it get the money to buy the loans from the banks and the answer is ultimately it gets the money from the european central bank um the topic of this talk is it's not all about nama and there are a number of reasons why this is the case the agency bought loans from the irish banks which were lent to commercial property so those banks were aib bank of ireland ebs irish nationwide um, and of course anglo-irish bank secondly it was only the loans in excess of 20 million euro that were taken into nama everything else remained in the banks now it's worth remembering that it wasn't just the irish banks who lent to the property developers british owned Bank of Scotland, Ireland, Ulster Bank, ACC owned by the normally sensible group Rabobank in Holland, Danish owned National Irish Bank, all of those banks went completely crazy too. Um, so the property loans from these banks are not part of NAMA, but they're very much part of the story of the Irish bust. These banks have come up with a variety of solutions to solve the problem of huge loans which won't be repaid and it's been their parent banks who've taken the hit in all of this in the case of bank of scotland ireland it meant that the british taxpayer had to put the money in to sort out the mess so we're not the only taxpayers who've been uh, paying money as a result of what happened here in terms of what properties are actually in nama it can actually be very difficult to find out the agency operates like a bank to the extent that it doesn't identify the debtors. And if there is a problem with the loan, if the developer can't repay it, and if the borrower isn't cooperating, the loans are then categorised as enforced. In other words, a receiver is frequently appointed. And then those properties involved appear on a list called enforced properties and you can look at it on the NAMA website and it's quite detailed and from the point of view of Georgian buildings um, there are quite a number of Georgian buildings on that list so a big question I think um, about conservation and in relation to NAMA is uh, it's going to as soon as it assumes control of properties effectively it's going to be responsible responsible for those properties with conservation properties as i'm sure you all know there are a lot of significant obligations some of them legal in relation to those properties so i think in cases where nam is going to hold on to buildings for a protracted period for commercial reasons there are issues there that need to be borne in mind for that organization a big question for the future is how long the property and banking crash is actually going to last and I think one of the lessons that has been learned about modern economics from the crash, both here and abroad, is that experts don't know as much as ordinary people thought that they actually did. If you look at the economic forecasts for Ireland over the past 10 years, we can see that nobody did a full formal economic forecast which predicted the bust. Now, there is um, one minor exception to that, who is the lecturer Morgan Kelly in UCD, who did write a number of articles and did do an academic paper for the SRI where he clearly predicted three things, that property is going to fall by about 50%, it's going to wipe out the banking system and the public finances are going to get ruined in all of this. 
Uh, but in terms of a proper full economic forecast where you simply say the economy is going to shrink so much, unemployment is going to do this, he never did any of those. So that's why I would say that there was no full economic forecast where the bust was actually predicted. Um, and even the organizations who run our bailout, if you look at their forecasts over the past 10 years, they got it hopelessly wrong. If you look, for instance, at the European Commission, who were one leg of the Troika, their forecasts were worse than the forecasts produced by the Irish stockbrokers and even by the Irish Central Bank and by the ESRI. Um, so it's very, very difficult to tell what's going to happen in the future. And obviously all of that has a bearing on the property market and on the general economy as well, because economists only have one way of predicting what's going to happen in the future, and that's looking at what happened in the past. But what we've learned in this country and in other countries is the past isn't a very good indicator as to what's going to happen in the future. So um, I don't think I'm going to uh, make any predictions about how long the current situation is going to last, but there is an old joke told about economists there's four people in a car. How do you tell which one is the economist? The answer being he's the one looking out of the back window telling you where you've just been. <laughs> um, so for that reason, I'm going to leave it there and not make any predictions regarding where we're going. So if you have any questions, I'd be um, delighted to take them.